Hi, I'm Yvon and I like coffee. Hi, my name is Geneviève and I like tea. Hi, I'm Ben and we all work in the math department. A math department is known to transform coffee into tea or M's. Yes, I like also cats. One more thing, don't be afraid, we won't prove any theorem within these videos. We are mathematicians that started to work some problem in computational chemistry. Computational chemistry is part of theoretical chemistry, where the idea is to simulate some models that represent the behavior of matter at the molecular level. And allows to understand, for instance, why caffeine and theine behave like psychoactive substances thanks to their molecular structure similar to adenosine. The similarity in the structure allows caffeine and theine to act like adenosine on the receptor that allows us to block the tiredness that we feel at some point. We are convinced that there are many more interesting problems than the one of caffeine and theine, and it is what we experience in our everyday life. We have decided to produce this video in order to facilitate the introduction of mathematicians to this field. Indeed, this field is full of acronymism and concepts that are difficult to grasp from the beginning and prevent to see the global picture. We hope that this video will allow you to understand rapidly this model and allow to work after this on the mathematical aspect. Enjoy it! In this series of videos, we would like to introduce quantum chemistry from a mathematical standpoint. We would like to describe the main models that are used to describe matter at an atomic scale and that are standard nowadays in quantum chemistry. We emphasize in particular the mathematical aspects. This should, however, be understandable for both mathematicians curious about quantum chemistry and chemists interested in mathematics. So if you want to know more about mathematics or quantum chemistry, then you should watch these videos. We start with a block of five videos where we go for where we introduce the hartree fock model and progress successively from the theoretical models to the discretization. In this first uh, video, we introduce and present you the basics of quantum chemistry that is required in order to understand the hartree fock model and the following developments. Mainly, we speak about the passage from classical to quantum mechanics and introduce the notion of the electronic Schrodinger equation. In the second episode, we address the hartree fock theory that replaces the model coming from the Schrodinger equation to lead to the so-called hartree fock equations. In the third episode, we explain how this set of equations is commonly discretized and subsequently solved in practice. And the last two episodes are devoted to the so-called post hartree fock methods. We take the hartree fock model and we try to successively refine the model in order to get more precise and accurate solutions to the original Schrodinger equation. Please be aware that the following presentation follows our mathematical point of view and thus differs from the classical presentation in quantum chemistry books. Geneviève will start explain the model on a simple system. Let us start with the simplest system one can imagine, namely the hydrogen atom. This atom has only one proton and one electron. The proton has a positive electric charge and the electron has a negative charge. For simplicity, and because we don't want to have a lot of constants around, we are mathematicians, remember? We choose a unit system in which the elementary charge is equal to 1. Hence, the charge of the proton is plus 1 and the charge of the electron is minus 1. Moreover, once again for simplicity, we fix the position of the proton at the origin and we study only the evolution of the electron. Now, how can we describe the time evolution of this system? If I had asked you the same question about cars or planets, you might have answered that the important variables are the positions and the velocities of the objects. And this is true. In classical mechanics, 
the state of a system of particles is characterized by their positions and velocities at all time. In the case of the hydrogen atom, since the position of the proton is fixed at the origin, the system is characterized by the position of the electron, which is x and belongs to R3, and the components are x1, x2 and x3, and by its momentum p, also in R3, with its components p1, p2, p3. If you have forgotten or never heard about the momentum of a particle, just recall that the momentum is equal to the mass times the velocity of the particle. Ok, but defining the state of the electron does not explain how it moves in space. To determine this evolution, we need to call on Newton's second law of motion. Developed to describe the motions of bodies, especially planets, this equation states that the time derivative of the momentum is equal to the sum of the forces applied to the system. So that is how we get the formula dp over dt equal to the sum of f. In the case of the hydrogen atom, the only force applied to the electron is the Coulomb force between the positive electric charge of the proton and the negative charge of the electron. Hence, the Coulomb force is directed from the electron to the proton. And this explains the minus sign in the formula. Its norm is equal to the inverse of the square of the distance between the electron and the proton. And you can make the computation x over x cubed is equal to 1 over x squared. Therefore, if we plug the expression of the Coulomb force into Newton's second law of motion, we get that the time derivative of the momentum is equal to minus x over x cubed. Can we express these equations only with the position x? Yes, in fact, it is possible. But first, because we really don't like constants, we choose a unit system in which also the mass of the electron is equal to 1. Then the momentum p of the electron is equal to the velocity v of the electron. And the velocity being the first order derivative of the position, Newton's second law of motion can be rewritten as a second order differential equation that only involves the position x of the electron. It reads, the second time derivative of the position is equal to minus x over x to the power of 3. This Newton's second law of motion can be solved quite easily in the case of the hydrogen atom. However, this is not always that simple. And Hamilton, back in 1833, proposed a reformulation of classical mechanics that could treat more efficiently complex systems, such as planetary orbits and celestial mechanics. Moreover, it was of great importance in the development of quantum mechanics. This formalism of classical mechanics is called the Hamiltonian mechanics. And in this new formalism, Newton's second law of motion can be rewritten as a system of first-order differential equations. The system is still described by its momentum p and its position x, but the equations rely on the definition of a new quantity called Hamiltonian, which depends both on the position and the momentum of the particle. The Hamiltonian is in fact equal to the total energy of the system. The energy is divided into two parts, the kinetic energy and the potential energy. First, the kinetic energy is half the velocity to the square. And since in our case the velocity is equal to the momentum, the kinetic energy is half the momentum to the square. Second, the potential energy is here the Coulomb potential energy and it is proportional to the inverse of the distance between the proton and the electron. In fact, the Hamiltonian is composed of two parts, one of them depending only on the momentum of the particle and the other one depending only on the position. 
And what is exactly the role of this Hamiltonian? In this setting, the equations of motion are described by two differential equations of first order depending on the position and the momentum of the particle. So the time derivative of the position is equal to the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the momentum. And the time derivative of the momentum is equal to minus the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the position. Of course, if you compute the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian, you will recover Newton's second law of motion exactly, which is completely normal since the two formulations are equivalent. A last thing, don't forget that the Hamiltonian is equal to the total energy of the system at all time. This will be of importance later. Now we have determined the classical evolution of the hydrogen atom. In this presentation, the electrons move around the nucleus like planets around the Sun. So what is next? Do we have all the information we need about our system? In fact, it is not that simple. This classical model of the hydrogen atom was used until the beginning of the 20th century, but unfortunately, it could not explain some phenomena. First, very early, the physicists realized that, unlike the planets, the electrons are electrically charged. Classically, this implies that they lose energy in their rotation by the emission of electromagnetic radiations. This leads, theoretically, to the very rapid collapse of the electron onto the nucleus. Second, and later through more recent experiments, came the problem of the quantization of the energy. This explains why the variations of the energy levels of the hydrogen atom must be discrete. But in the classical model I presented, the energy can a priori take any value. Therefore, it cannot explain this phenomenon. For all these reasons, another model has been developed for the hydrogen atom that led to the development of quantum mechanics by many physicists, among which Max Planck, Niels Bohr, Paul Dirac. So now, Ben, could you explain what the theory is about? This new theory, called quantum mechanics, that was introduced in the beginning of the 20th century can explain the phenomenon of energy quantization, which appears at the very small spatial scale. Hence, the role of quantum mechanics was not to replace the model proposed by Newton in, in the 17th century, but to fill the gap at the very small spatial scale where Newton mechanics is doing a poor job. The first major difference between quantum and classical mechanics is that the position and the momentum of a particle cannot be determined at the same time exactly. This is known under the name of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Therefore, in the model of quantum mechanics, our electron is no longer defined by the position and the momentum of it, but by a notion called the wave function, which maps any position x at time t to a complex number. The wave function is usually denoted by psi. Part of the physical meaning comes through the modulus square of the wave function. For each t, the modulus square of the wave function is the probability distribution to find the electron at position x. Hence, the description of the system is intrinsically probabilistic. We can no longer speak about the position and momentum of the electron, but rather from a probability to find the electron in a certain volume of the space. Further, the wave function encodes even, even further information. The square modulus of its Fourier transform is the probability to find the electron with a certain momentum p at time t. The second important postulate in quantum mechanics is that every measurable quantity can be associated with an operator. For example, the energy operator will be the quantum Hamiltonian. 
In order to find the quantum Hamiltonian, there are some rules that can be applied in order to do the passage from classical to quantum mechanics. Indeed, the energy operator is nothing else than the expectation value of the classical Hamiltonian. So as you see, we have two parts. The first one is the integral over all possible momentum, where we have the classical kinetic energy, which is p square over 2, times the probability that our electron will have this momentum. The second part is the potential energy, where it's again we have an integral of all over all possible positions of 1 over x, which is the Coulomb uh, potential energy, times the probability that our electron is at the location x. This is, however, not the usual form you find the quantum Hamiltonian. Indeed, we can apply now some math in order to massage this term a little bit. So as you see, uh, we do the following developments. First, we note that p times the Fourier transform of psi is equal to minus i times the Fourier transform of its gradient. So now we're taking this first term associated to the kinetic energy, where we have the integral of p squared times psi hat squared. So we combine first the two absolute values in order to get one absolute value of p times psi hat. And then we use the little formula we have developed up there. And then re or remark that minus i is not contributing to the absolute value. So we are ending up with the integral over R3 of the modulus square of the Fourier transform of the gradient of psi. And now finally, we observe that the Fourier transform is an isometry. So the L2 norm of the function is equal to the L2 norm of its Fourier transform. OK, now we can insert this development into the, the uh, formula of the energy. And we first do an integration by parts where we take the modulus square of the gradient and write it as psi star Laplace psi and a minus sign appears in front of it. We do a similar development of writing the modulus square as psi star 1 over x psi for the second part in the energy. Then finally, we combine the Laplace and the 1 minus x operator and call minus one half Laplace minus one over x, we call this the operator H, which is our quantum Hamiltonian. And then the energy writes as psi star times H applied to psi, where the star here means nothing else than the conjugate complex of psi. In contrast to classical Hamiltonian uh, mechanics, the quantum Hamiltonian is now an operator and is again the sum of two parts, a kinetic part and a Coulomb operator. The kinetic energy operator is given by the Laplacian or more precisely by minus one half Laplacian, where the Laplacian is nothing else than the sum of all coordinates of x and as gathering the second derivatives. The Coulomb operator is a multiplicative potential. This means it acts on any wave function and just multiplies the value of the wave functions times minus 1 over x. Hence, the Hamiltonian can be written as the sum of the two parts. The major equation corresponding to Newton's second law in classical mechanics is now the Schrodinger equation. It describes the evolution of the wave function through time and writes like i times the partial derivative of psi with respect to time is equal to the Hamiltonian acting on the wave function. In general, this equation is very complicated to solve, but it has one nice property. It is a linear equation. This means if we have two solutions of the equation, the sum is also a solution of the equation. This is known as the superposition principle. Assume for now that h is a very trivial operator. It is just the multiplication by a constant e. This means h acting on a wave function phi is nothing else than e times the wave function itself. In this simple case, the solution to this time-dependent Schrodinger equation then simply reads psi of xt 
is a psi naught that depends only on the spatial variable x times the complex exponential uh, e to the power of minus i e t. Now for a general operator h, which is independent of time, it is therefore natural to try to diagonalize the operator, or more precisely to find the spectrum of the operator. The solution then writes a linear combination of these eigenmodes or eigenstates, as appears here in this formula. Therefore, the difficulty boils down to find the eigenstates of the operator, and this is known as the Schrodinger time independent equation. It consists of finding eigenstates of the Schrodinger operator, that means that we want to find a psi n and a corresponding eigenvalue e n such that the Hamiltonian applied to psi n is equal to e n times psi n. In our case of the simple hydrogen atom, one can solve the Schrodinger equation exactly because there's only one electron and everything appears to be simple. Unfortunately, the structure gets much more complicated when we consider systems with more than one electron and we cannot solve the equation exactly. But first, we need to generalize this framework to systems with more than one electron. Are you curious how this works? Hey Ivo, why don't you explain us how this works in a general case of a system with n electrons? Okay, suppose now we are interested in a much bigger system composed of m nuclei and n electrons. The m nuclei will have a charge z alpha, where alpha represents the number of the nuclei. The position of the nuclei is represented by r alpha, and uh, the number of nuclei is capital M. The n electrons around these nuclei will be of charge minus one with the system of units that we have chosen. We will denote their position by xi, i being the number of the electron. A priori, the system should be represented by a wave function depending on three times n plus m variable. Three because we are in R3, n electrons, m nuclei. Now comes the remark that the mass of the proton is 1,800 times the mass of the electron. This makes the nuclei much heavier than the electron. And thus, the time scale of the electron is much more rapid. This is why it is classical to make an assumption using this different of time scale. First, we will focus on the movement of the electrons, and then we can consider the movement of the nuclei. These nuclei can be considered as classical particles, as was introduced by Geneviève, but they can also be considered as quantum particles. But the electron must be considered as quantum particle. This approximation is known as the born oppenheimer approximation and is used for discretization solution. The born oppenheimer approximation allows to replace the wave function of three n plus m variables associated with the m nuclei and the n electrons to a wave function of three n variables associated with the only n electrons. Note that the Born-Oppenheimer approximation leads to errors that can be measured, that can be corrected. This approximation is compatible with a treatment for the nuclei that are either classical or quantum. The nuclei being assumed to be fixed, we now only need to represent the behavior of the electron. Like for the hydrogen atom, the wave function will represent the probability of finding the electrons at a position x and at time t. The wave function is now a function of three n variables because we have n electrons. The interpretation of the wave function is as before. The square of this modulus represents the probability to find electron 1 at position x1, electron 2 at position x2, electron n at position xn, and this for every time t. So this is the probability density to find the n electron at position x1, x2, xn at time t. 
Since psi is a probability density, then the integral of the square of the modulus should be 1 at every time t, the integral being taken over each variable, so there is a dx1, dx2, dxn in this formula. An important notion at this level is the notion of electronic density. This is a function of R3 that is equal, like is here, at n times the integral over R3 n minus 1 of the square of the modulus of the psi function times dx2, dx3, dxn. So we do not integrate over the x1 variable. Now comes another constraint on the wave function known as the Pauli principle. In addition to the norm one condition that is assumed on the wave function, we have to encode the fact that the electrons are indistinguishable. In fact, electrons belong to a class of particles that are known as fermions. This means that the wave function is anti-symmetric with respect to the position of the electrons. This is the Pauli principle. Anti-symmetry is defined as a change of sign of the wave function when we exchange two particles, like is written here. This implies in particular that the probability of finding two particles at the same position is equal to zero. So let us now speak about uh, the functional space where the wave function belongs to. It has to encode the fact that the square of the modulus of the wave function is bounded, is equal to one. This is known as the L2 space. The L2 space is part of a larger family called the Lebesgue space. And note that this function don't need to be continuous. As said before, since the wave function has to be anti-symmetric with respect to the position of the particle, we need to impose this anti-symmetry. As was said for the hydrogen atom, this wave function encodes a lot of properties that can be derived from the knowledge of the wave function. Actually, the wave function should be a function of four n variable. We explained about the three n variable. We go from three n to four n because we add a quantity which is known as the spin. This is a discrete quantity and the discrete quantity is equal to plus one half, which represents the spin up, or to minus one half, which represents the spin down. For simplicity, however, in this episode, we won't speak about the spin. Our wave function will thus be only a function of three n variables. This leads to a simplification in the equation and allows to focus on the mathematical properties we want to describe. But the spin can be recovered and introduced in the equation if required. Let us address now the way the wave function is defined. As before, it represents an equilibrium of energies, the kinetic energies and the Coulomb attraction energies. The equation, which is again equivalent to the Newton's second law in the case of classical particles, is still the Schrodinger equation. It reads I d psi over dt equal h psi. The Hamiltonian is an extension to the one introduced for the hydrogen atom and takes into account the kinetic energy and the Coulombic attraction and repulsion. So this is the electronic Hamiltonian. The first part represents the delta symbol of the Laplacian with respect to the variable xj. It represents the kinetic energy of each electron. It treats delta xj equals the sum from d equal to 1 to 3 of d squared divided by dxg day to the square, with xj equal to xg1, xg2, xg3 represented and associated to electron number j. The second term in the Hamiltonian models the interaction between each electron and the nuclei. It corresponds to the attractive Coulomb force between the opposite charged particles. The operator is a multiplicative potential and is proportional to the charge Z alpha of nucleus at position R alpha 
and is inversely proportional to the distance between the nuclei and the electron as in the classical Coulomb law. The third term models the interaction between the electrons. It corresponds to the repulsive Coulomb force between the electrons. Here again, the operator is a multiplicative potential inversely proportional to the distance between the electrons. As an example, consider the case of one nucleus, m equal to one, and two electrons, n equal to two. So the electronic Hamiltonian is the sum between j equal to one and two of one half of delta indexed by xj, plus z1 divided by r1 minus xj, plus the sum from i j equal to one to two with i less than j, of 1 divided by xi minus xj in modulus. Note that actually this last contribution has only one term. The Hamiltonian applied to the wave function thus reads h applied to the wave function psi, function of x1 and x2, is equal to minus one half of the Laplacian with respect to x1 plus z1 divided by r1 minus x1 in modulus applied to psi as a function of x1 and x2 minus the same contribution where x2 takes the place of x1 of psi x1 times x2 plus the last contribution of the repulsion between electrons that reads 1 divided by the modulus of x1 minus x2 times psi of x1 and x2. This time-dependent Schrödinger equation is again linear and involves an Hamiltonian that is independent on time. As was explained earlier by Ben, its resolution involves the determination of the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. And it is the same, actually, if we are interested in the steady state in the equilibrium position corresponding to the ground state of the Hamiltonian. We are thus interested in explaining what is the energy of the system. Given now a quantum system expressed by a wave function psi, the corresponding energy is given by the scalar product between the psi function and the Hamiltonian applied to psi. It reads E of psi is the integral over R3n of psi star h psi over the whole R3n space. Before going further, it's time now to introduce the classical bracket formulation introduced by the chemist. This corresponds to the widely used notation written here. So in this notation, here is the bra on the left, here is the ket on the right. And this corresponds to the integral of psi star h psi. So the ground state of the medibody Schrödinger energy is represented by the minimum of the energy. E0 is the infimum of the, in the bracket notation, psi h psi, and in the classical mathematical representation, the integral over R3n of psi star h psi. A few remarks are now in order. In case of external interaction, further contribution should be added to the energy. This is the case, for instance, for an external magnetic field. In our particular case, we notice that in the Hamiltonian, all the coefficients are real. And thus, the wave function, that is a complex function, and has a real part and an imaginary part, is such that each contribution is solution to the Hamiltonian problem, h psi equal to e psi. And thus, we can consider, and this is what we will do later, that the wave function is not a complex one, but a real one. The second remark is that the model we consider is based on three ingredients. First come the definition of the wave function that encapsulates everything we can measure on the system we consider. Second comes the space of anti-symmetric function that are L2 function with norm 1. Finally comes the definition of the Hamiltonian with all the interaction we want to put on the system. 
Aside of this scene, Gradient remembers that the problem we consider can be time-dependent or we are interested in the equilibrium. In order to solve the problem, we have to apprehend the wave function. So let's consider first a function of one variable. In order to see if the function is increasing or decreasing, you need two information, and this is a very rough information. Remember now that we are not in 1D, but each particle is already in R3. In R3, we need two information in each of the three dimensions, and this gives eight information, two to the three information. Now, in order to represent the wave function depending on n electrons, we need to have two to the three m information. These are known as the degrees of freedom. But what is two to the three n? So let's take the example of the carbon dioxide, in which you have 22 electrons. 22 times 3 gives 66, and 2 to the 66 is very large. It is almost 10 to the power 20. So in order to represent very roughly the wave function associated to the carbon dioxide, you need this much degrees of freedom and this is impossible on the current architecture of the computers. In 1929, already Dirac stated that the fundamental laws are known, but they are far too difficult to be discretized and solved. About one century later, this may seem depressing. We are still unable to solve the Schrodinger equation. But this is still a challenge. This can imply and involve new ideas and new concepts that may lead to Fields Medal or Nobel Prize. So let's come. In this video, we saw that the classical model could not explain all the phenomena appearing at a very small scale, especially when it comes to the behavior of the atoms and the molecules. A new theory called quantum mechanics has been developed, and this led to the development of the Schrodinger model. This model is actually very nice. If relativistic effects are not important, then this model describes very well the behavior of the electrons. And in addition, the problem is linear and has some very nice structure. Unfortunately, this model is not tractable with numerical methods, due to the high dimensionality of the space the wave function acts on. Ben, could you illustrate that with a small metaphor? Of course. So Erwin Schrödinger could have helped us for the illustration, but he passed away in 1961. So I brought his cat, Erwin. Take the cat as the reality, as we'll find it in nature. The reality <laughs> the reality is usually difficult to grasp and measure, exactly like this cat. In this sense, the Schrodinger model is like looking at the cat through a very, very expensive optical lens of a photo camera. It is not the reality of it, but it is very close to it.